All right, so um, most of this is published already, although I'm gonna present also a few new things as well. Um, and it's just addressing an old question, um, which several groups have tried to address in the past, which is how come movement doesn't occur mm -hmm. during motor preparation or action observation? And, and, and again, if, if you've heard this before in this meeting or before, I apologize, but uh, obviously in, in, in the motor cortex in particular, but also in premotor cortex, there's modulation of activity during an instructed delay paradigm, such as this, this is a uh, recording in motor cortex. Um, and during the instructed delay period, and many other people, Alexa has shown this, uh, there's modulation. And yet uh, during that delay period, the monkey, uh, macaque monkey is, is not allowed to move uh, and doesn't move. So how, how is that possible? Even though we know that the primary motor cortex in particular provides a large proportion of the cortical spinal tract that innervates motor neurons ultimately and drives movement. Also, we know action observation when monkeys watch a video game they had just performed, uh, many groups have also found that in a subset of neurons, uh, there's almost congruent modulation between active movement and observation. And yet in this, in, these, in this paradigm, the monkey is not making any movements. They're simply observing a cursor moving to targets uh, in, a, in a task that they had previously done with their, with their arm. So, you know, there, you know, how do you, how do you, um, how do you address this problem? I mean, there, there are different hypotheses. One is a gating hypothesis, which is suggests that there's some sort of gate that prevents signals from, uh, that are created in the motor cortex from traveling down the spinal cord and ultimately, uh, uh driving motor neurons. Um, at least, at least in the awake system, um, there's no, no one's really found such a gating mechanism. Um, another possibility is a threshold uh, idea, which is that you know cells uh, during preparation or during action observation might might be modulating, but they're not modulating as much as they would during active movement, and so uh, there's some nonlinear threshold mechanism that prevents that lower than that less activity from actually driving motor output. Um, that's an interesting idea, although there, there are many cases, particularly in premotor cortex where preparatory activity is even larger uh, than during active movement. And premotor cortex also sends cortical spinal projections down to motor neurons ultimately. Another idea is from Matt Kaufman and, and Krishna Shinoi's lab, which is this null space, null space hypothesis, which I guess you've already talked about today, which is the idea that you have this very large dimensional system and during preparation or maybe even during action observation, um, uh, because of this high dimensionality, uh, activity could be uh, meandering in the null space of the matrix that maps neural activity to movement. And so if it's sitting in that null space, um, there's no overt movement taking place. It's only once it enters the potent space um, does it result in movement. So these are all, I think, viable hypotheses, but there's, there's something that's missing, I think, from all these proposed solutions, which is there's something happening at the mesoscopic scale in motor cortex. Uh, right before movement initiation, which is this local oscillatory desynchronization, which uh, is an old idea. And it's all, uh, well, I mean, the op sorry, it's an old observation, but what we've put a little new twist to it. So if you look at motor cortex, this is uh, a recording of the local field potential <clears throat> from one electrode using a Utah array during, uh, an instructed delay task. So zero is when the construction queue comes on. This, this line right here is when the go queue happens and then the solid line is when the movement begins. Uh, and you just take the raw local field potential, you can see 
this very these oscillations, the so-called beta oscillations, which are uh, can be accentuated when you, if you bandpass filter the signal between somewhere between 15 and 40 hertz, and, and you see these prominent beta oscillations during the preparation to move, which then attenuate after the go cue prior to movement execution. If you look at the uh, spectrograms, you also see the same thing. Uh, you see this very, uh, on the left, you have the instructed delay period. Zero is when the instruction comes on. Uh, you see prominent beta oscillation power, which then attenuates prior to movement initiation on the right panel. And then when the movement ends, uh, the beta oscillations reemerge. Uh, we, we talk about this as a desynchronization phenomenon because if you look at spikes, um, spikes tend to fire uh, at a, a particular preferred phase of the oscillation. So on the left here during the preparation activity, pre preparation, preparation period, this is a histogram of spike triggered LFP phase of the beta phase. And you see cells tend to spike at a preferred phase. And so there, therefore, by implication, you have many local cells that if they share the same preferred phase, they're highly synchronized. Uh, on the other hand, later on, right before movement onset, when the beta uh, oscillations uh, attenuate, you don't, you don't see that phase preference. Now, uh, the other thing, uh, is that these um, these uh, this attenuation phenomenon seems to correlate with reaction time? Um, again, not very surprising. But if uh, if you now instead of taking the power uh, the spectrum, you actually compute the the amplitude of the beta with the Hilbert transform, you can and then group different trials from either short reaction trial trials reaction time trials in blue versus long reaction time trials in yellow, you can see that the attenuation phenomenon uh, occurs either earlier for short or later for long reaction times. If you now take those same groups of trials and you align on movement onset, they all tend to attenuate at the same fixed time prior to movement initiation. So a few years ago, uh, Matt Best and, and, our, uh, and others in the lab found that if you now look at space across the array of electrodes we're recording from in the motor cortex, this phenomenon of a beta attenuation uh, isn't synchronous. That is, it doesn't happen at the same time across, the, across space, but rather forms a pattern. Um, so this blue electrode attenuates a little bit earlier than the green one, which in turn, attenuates a little earlier than the red one. Across the whole array, you can actually find us a, a nice spatial, spatial temporal pattern where um, let's in this particular example, the more caudal sites in blue attenuate earlier than the, the red, uh, the more rostral sites in red. The color code indicates the time at which attenuation occurs. And you can fit this with a with a plane and, 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 and from which you can then determine a beta attenuation orientation, which is that arrow. This is show, showing you the array. The central sulcus is here, the arcuate sulcus is here. So this is rostral towards the nose. This is the back of the head uh, on the left. So that's all great, but what's uh, one thing that was disturbing to us was that this is all based on trial averaging. And that's typically what people do when they look at desynchronization, uh, whether it's in, in non-human primates or in humans, um, they trial average. So we really wanted to look at single trials. So what we did was we managed, you, uh, and this is work that Karth uh, in, in the lab spearheaded, which is uh, using an autoencoder neural network, we could, and, and, and some filtering afterwards, we could actually extract single trial beta attenuation profiles. And so this is an example from a single trial. Each line here represents a different electrode. On one trial, 
after it's fed through this autoencoder. And you can see that you do, you can actually extract single trial attenuation profiles. And what came to much uh, to a, a surprise to us was that these patterns are not what we could infer from the trial average data exactly. Instead, what we found was depending on the trial, some trials attenuated in one direction, such as this top one here. So this is a single trial. Each color represents a different electrode on the left. And on the right is a heat map showing you the time at which each electrode on the array attenuated um, on that given trial. And the beta attenuation orientation is uh, down and to the left, which is roughly um, in the caudal to rostral direction from the back to the front. On the trial below here, we see the exact opposite pattern. This is another trial, same electrodes, but now we see a pattern propagating in the exact opposite direction from the rostral to the caudal direction. Now, if you take a whole uh, set of trials, what we found was a bimodal distribution of or, uh, beta attenuation orientations. So this is now from one experimental session uh, where a monkey is making a reaching movement. We look at the attenuation profiles across the electrodes for different trials. This is just a histogram of orientations. And you can see some are, or, are propagating in the rostral medial direction, the other, uh, another subset are propagating in the caudal lateral direction and very few propagating in other directions. And that was true in all our monkeys we found. So uh, we're, we're exploring this phenomenon uh, in other tasks. So that's something we're, that's ongoing and in also in different species as well. So for example, in this completely different task um, where monkeys were asked to, instead of using their arm, use their tongue to apply force on a force transducer. And then from which we could then infer, we could measure the force onset. We also found attenuation in the orofacial area of motor cortex and extracted single trial or uh, attenuation profiles and found likewise a distribution of spatially organized propagation of attenuations that followed a bimodal distribution largely. So that's a completely different end effector. It's the tongue uh, and we see the same thing. We're also looking at other tasks as well, such as uh, a hand task, which is just uh, pinching using just the thumb and the index finger. We see the same phenomenon. We've also looked at human data. This is from a human subject uh, from the University of Pittsburgh. This is a part of a, uh, a brain machine interface study uh, where uh, this is a spinal cord injured patient who had some residual movement in his wrist. And uh, so we conducted, an, they conducted an experiment where they asked the subject, the human subject to make overt wrist extension movements. These are, uh, these are actually isometric uh, extension movements. Uh, and uh, likewise, we find attenuation in the hand knob area of, of, of motor cortex in the human. We also find uh, spatially organized propagation, which again is bimodally distributed. This is in two kinds of task trials. These are low force trials and these are high force trials. Uh, each, and, and so we're seeing a distribution of orientations that form an axis going one way or the other. And it doesn't really seem to depend on the nature of the task or the, you know, the condition, whether it's high force or low force. Okay, uh, so we see that at the, uh, at the local field potential level. How about at the unit level? Or is unit activity spatially oriented? Uh, unfortunately, we can't record units on every electrode typically with the Utah rays. 
And um, so we had to figure out another way to look at these spatially, spatial patterns. And one way we try to do it is look at functional connectivity. And, and so this is work that uh, Taka Takahashi has done in the past, uh, looking using kind of a GLM based Granger causality analysis to infer functional connections between units recorded on different electrodes. So the, the, the essential idea is you're trying to predict the response, the firing rate of one neuron right here based on the past responses uh, of another neuron recorded on this electrode um, and, and, and use, um, a, use a GLM to, to infer these connections. So we did that and we looked at different time periods uh, and, and then from that, we could then plot the distribution of oriented functional connections. And here's just a, this is not real data. Well, it is real data, but I'm not, I don't, I don't wanna focus on the realness of it, but just what, what we're trying to do, create a distribution of oriented connections on oriented on the cortical surface on, uh, on, on the motor cortex. So in this example here, we have uh, lots of functional connections oriented in this direction uh, uh, or in this direction and very few in the opposite directions. Okay, so let me show you some real data. Uh, so we, we, we looked at, uh, this is now just a, a simple reaching movement to a single movement direction. We, uh, and, and here's just a representation of the tangential velocity of the arm these are the units we recorded, and these are actually multi-unit activity, not single unit. So we didn't, you know, focus on uh, doing careful spike sorting, but just threshold crossing recordings. We then applied that uh, functional connectivity analysis that I just talked about, and then measured the distribution of oriented connections across the cort cortical surface. And that's what's plotted on the right here. And you can see they're oriented along an axis, which matches nearly perfectly the beta attenuation axis that we measured with the local field potentials. That's shown in the blue arrow. The dotted arrows represent the, the two modes of functional connections based on multi-unit activity. Now, if you look a little bit earlier during this preparation period, right before movement onset, and, and, and measure the, num, uh, the functional connections, we see uh, a nearly orthogonal distribution of connections, of oriented connections that don't match the BAO axis. We could even go further back in time during the instruct, instructed delay period. And, and if you look particularly during the late instructed delay period, we see really just a, uh, an orthogonal distribution of functional connections. Uh, so the cells are modulating as others have shown, uh, but their, their functional connections are oriented uh, in, a, in a way that's inconsistent with the BAO, BAO axis. So could we provide uh, causal evidence that this propagating pattern of ex what we call, it's really a propagating pattern of excitability, the way we think about it, that's based on work that people have done with transcranial magnetic stimulation that show that there's a relationship between beta um, oscillation strength and excitability uh, by delivering TMS at different uh, and correlating the effects of TMS on muscles with beta power and found a negative correlation. So when beta power is low, uh, the effects of TMS is, are high. And so we think of this propagating pattern, spatial pattern really as a pattern of excitability. So do, can we provide causal evidence that this pattern is a necessary component for movement initiation? So one, one approach we took was to use patterned electrical stimulation across the array. So imagine you, we have measured a BAO axis like this. It's oriented in the ross caudal direction. And we have an array of electrodes. This is now an eight by eight array of electrodes. Um, 
what we did was then delivered electrical stimulation that either matched the natural pattern uh, on a given trial. Now this is again, because we know on different trials, we get different patterns of orient, uh, propagating patterns of, of uh, excitability. If we deliver a pattern of electrical stimulation where we stimulate these sets of electrodes first, then this one, as well as the, the, the next one over, then these two, then these two and so forth, so as to mimic the natural pattern of beta attenuation propagation and, and, and deliver the stimulation pattern right before movement onset, could we affect reaction time? That was what we wanted to address. So we either delivered the pattern congruent with the natural propagating pattern or against the natural pattern. So now it's now we're delivering stimulation on the left set of electrodes and, and shifting these electrode stimulations, moving them to the right. So then now propagating against the natural pattern we see with the local field potentials. So what we, to make a long story short, we found that if we deliver this stimulation um, in a congruent fashion, that's shown in these blue, this blue point, these blue points, we see no effect on reaction time. However, when we stimulate in incongruently, so what's key here is we're using the same electrodes, the same currents, the same frequencies, but now delivering them in the, in the opposite order that is incongruent with the natural pattern, we can delay reaction time significantly. So we think this propagating pattern it's, it's, it's not enough that uh, desynchronization happens on a single electrode, but rather you need to deliver, you need, a, uh, you need a desynchronization to evolve in a, in a spatial temporal, in a, in a spatially organized fashion to facilitate movement initiation. Nico, you have three minutes left. Okay. This is, this is now just the, the summary results from many experiments we did in three monkeys. And you can see that stimulation uh, with incongruent stimulation, we can get uh, longer relative reaction times versus when we stimulate congruent with, it, with a natural pattern. So finally, I wanted to just show you what this BAO axis, how it relates to the, the natural somatotopic organization of motor cortex. So in, the, in, in this slide, what I'm showing you here in the heat maps are not uh, attenuation times, but rather the effects of super threshold stimulation on different electrodes um, and, and looking at the effects on uh, muscle twitches in different parts of the arm. In uh, monkey BX, you can see uh, we've got two electrodes two eight by eight electrodes, also for monkey LS. But uh, on the other hand, for monkey MK, we only have one array. And you can see if you take, for example, I guess it's most clear here with monkey LS, you can see sites over here uh, elicit movements of the proximal arm, that is the shoulder and the elbow that's shown in blue. Whereas this array shows, um, evokes movements of the distal wrist and fingers. So you can actually fit this um, somatotopic organization with a plane, just re re with regression, and 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 the gray, I mean the brown arrow indicates the direction of sort of the uh, the somatotopic gradient from proximal to distal. And what you see in all three cases that is that the BAO axis, which is shown in the double blue arrows, are not congruent with the somatotopic gradient. If, in fact, it may be nearly orthogonal to the, the natural somatotopic gradient. So that's pretty much all I had to say. I just wanna tell you what we're, we're working on right now, which is we're trying to look at this. Uh, um, this is in collaboration with my colleague, Callum Ross, who's interested in orofacial movements. We're gonna compare a, two different tasks in the same monkey where we, in, uh, we have the monkey either grasp an object or bite down on the same object. Now, using the mouth and the hand in many ways, those two end effectors have very uh, 
there, there are certain similarities in the way, uh, just psychophysically, the way one uh, bites down on something and how one uses a whole hand grasp to grasp down on something. So we're gonna have monkeys do one of, uh, either one of those tasks and record from both arm area and I mean hand area as well as face area and, and determine whether these propagating patterns we see are specific to particular somatotopic areas or is it a global pattern? So when the monkey sort of bites down on the object, do we see propagating patterns only in the face area or does it, uh, do we also see it in the, in the hand area? So that's about it. This is my group and thank you for your attention.